Search and Counter Propaganda, of which I was a deputy chief, is engaged neither in research nor in counter propaganda. It is department which is compiling information of private nature on individuals divided in two groups, good boys and bad boys. The sympathetic people were promoted in media and, and public life. Uh, the people who were opposed to the Soviet foreign policy were blackwashed, blackmailed and, and, and destroyed, first morally and, and sometimes physically too. Uh, understanding of what I was doing came to me when I, when I looked through a press release of United States Information Service describing an incident in a South Vietnamese city of Hue, captured by communists from Hanoi for, for 48 hours. Then it was recaptured by United States and South, South Vietnamese armies and to their horror they discovered that within two nights the communists could manage to round up more than 15,000 people and execute them. Uh, most of these people were either sympathetic to the United States or to the Western culture or directly involved uh, in, in activities uh, uh, supporting the United States presence in South Vietnam, agents of CIA naturally, even barbers because they know too much. They were executed and the United States intelligence couldn't figure out how could they possibly do it in such short period of time. Later on they discovered, uh, they found out from several defectors that long before communists occupied that city, uh, there was an extensive omnipresent network of informers who knew exactly the addresses, the names, the whereabouts of each individual who was later executed. When I turned to my own files, I discovered that basically that information exists in my department. So it doesn't take much intelligence to understand what I was doing in India. I was compiling information. Comes revolution, these people would be executed. Indirectly, I was involved in, in, a, in a criminal activity, in, in mass murder. I decided to defect and explain it to Americans, and the uh, response I already described, I was called a paranoid. But I decided to defect and try nevertheless. This is another long story. It's virtually impossible to defect in India simply because Indian government, under pressure from the Soviet government, if you can call them government, I don't call them government, I call them junta. Uh, they adopted a law as early as, as, as in 61 or 62, after, after Stalin's daughter defection especially. That law states that no embassy, no, no foreign uh, uh, legation on the territory of Indian Republic has a right to extend political asylum to any defector from any country, which is very, it's, it's a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but a Soviet one needs a political asylum. <laughs> uh, if you are a Canadian or American, if you want to be nasty to your own government, the maximum you can do is just to pick up a phone and and make a dirty phone call to your ambassador. <laughs> Buy yourself a ticket and get lost. <laughs> what, what happens to a Soviet defector in, under that law? If I knock a door of, of United States Embassy, by that law, the American diplomats have to turn me back to the Indian police and Indian police takes me back directly back to the Soviet Embassy. And that's the end of, of my uh, defection. So knowing that perfectly well and having contacts both with Indian police and American uh, media corps, I, I understood that the only way for me was to disappear for a while and the best way I discovered was to mix with a group of hippies. Mind you, that, <laughs> that was the time <laughs> I I was 13 years younger, so I looked slightly different, of course. <laughs> uh, I studied so-called counterculture in India. Uh, sometimes uh, good, sincere young people who wanted to study oriental mysticism and culture and religion, but most of them were simply easygoing individuals who were delighted with exotic, exotic life and and um, the easiness with which they can purchase hashish and, and other drugs in India. And sometimes they traveled Indian subcontinent without any identification papers. So the best way to, to uh, escape detection was to mix with the group of hippies and travel in India 
uh, until the campaign in the media and, and in the police, uh, the police search will subside. All the newspapers in India carried my picture and uh, announcement of the police uh, that anyone coming forward with information about my whereabouts would receive 5,000 or 2,000 rupees. Knowing that perfectly well, I just walked in there barefoot with beads and blue jeans, smoking hush and um, enjoying life until I found sympathetic journalists who smuggled me from India to Greece, mind you, that was a military dictatorship at that time. Then only I approached uh, American CIA and they helped me to uh, land in Canada as a legit uh, ordinary uh, immigrant. So now I'm a Canadian citizen, as you can see from my patriotic type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Canada is a kind of middle of the, way, uh, of the road country where uh, there are so many various ethnic groups that another uh, strange character who speaks both Russian and, and English and two oriental languages, did, did, I, I, I didn't have any problem uh, fitting into academic circles and first being just a student at the University of Toronto and later a producer with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I think it was successful, and until and unless the, there will be follow-up to that uh, movie, uh, it will remain as as a as an open wound in in the United States as a scare tactic. Uh, which in this particular case, I'm not sure whether KGB paid for production of that movie or not. But it's totally irrelevant. What is the most important, unless after seeing the tragic sequences of, of the uh, uh, nuclear attack, uh, American population is not explained what to do about it. If you still stop at that and l let it be, obviously, th this is the scare tactic, this is the greatest harm done to the United States by, by Americans, by American filmmaker. I bet a drop of an all his disinformation uh, system could not, could not possibly do that much harm to the United States. When, when you see something obviously sponsored by the Soviets, uh, you understand, well, this is propaganda. You may or may not agree with this, depending on your background and, uh, and, and intelligence and education. But here it's a subtle approach, uh, playing on the most sensitive strings of your soul, appealing to, to the most basic instincts of, of, of human nature, survival. But there, there are no answers. How to survive? Well, obviously, disarmament is not the answer. Simply because some people naively expect Andropov to blush uh, out of shame and reduce the number of warheads. And it doesn't happen this way. This, we are facing unresponsive, irresponsible group of people for whom uh, nuclear war it's not a theory, it's a practice, and the, the military strategy of the Soviet Union is designed to, to do nuclear war and to survive, and possibly to win. I, I, was, I started my military training when I was six or seven years old, when I, when I entered secondary school. And I graduated in 63 after almost 15 years of continuous training as a junior lieutenant of reserve of the Soviet army and uh, psychologically every Soviet citizen is well prepared for, for, for war, nuclear war and uh, technically he is equipped with facilities and the knowledge how to use it in case of war or, or natural disaster, doesn't matter. Survival tactics and survival um, methods are taught extensively in, in various manners, they, they, they are exposed to documentary movies about nuclear war. They know the, the technical data of, of radiation or, or contamination of, of air and, and land. They know the organizational patterns of, of civil defense to such an extent that even if there is no nuclear attack, even if there is conventional uh, warfare, each individual at, at a certain time knows exactly where to go, what to do, where is the shelter, uh, whom to call by telephone, uh, which is not the case unfortunately in the United States. I think if, if a bomb, ordinary bomb, maybe a sting bomb is dropped in the middle of Los Angeles, 
Most of the people will not die of uh, atomic radiation. They will die of panic. They will, they will run and uh, the traffic jams and, 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 and the panic will kill more people than, than any, anything else. And where do they go? Is, is, is there any literature about how to protect an individual? Is the f medical first aid treatment, it, it's not taught to, to, to kids in the American colleges? unfortunately. For example, there's obvious uh, tension in the world. Uh, t television newscasts um, inform American family about happenings in, in uh, East and West Germany. And only at the last moment they decide to bring the canned food down to the basement. <laughs> it's a sheer idiocy. Why not to have them in the basement at, the, at peacetime? Uh, number two, there's, there's very realistic picture of what happens uh, when the first nuclear bomb strikes uh, a big city, Kansas City, I think. And people uh, a, a big panoramic uh, picture shows almost an ant hill when you know people are disoriented totally. That would produce laugh in Russia because unlike that, Soviets know exactly what to do. There'll well, they'll be much less panic, if, if, if at all. Uh, I, I know about infiltration of KGB into peace movement probably as much as an average uh, American who reads newspapers uh, systematically. But uh, I'm obviously I, I'm aware that the World Peace Council is, is a front organization of, of the KGB. Ramesh Chandra I know personally, both in India and USSR. I work, worked with delegations of, of um, various peaceniks who came to the World Congress of, 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 of Peace Council in Moscow, I think it was in 1961 or 62. Yeah, it was before Cuban crisis. And uh, at that time, they struck me as, as people who are pathologically unable to see the truth, uh, not to talk about the, the military aspects. When, I, when as a translator and, and a guide, I used to take them to places in Moscow which are not supposed to be for foreigners' eyes, uh, they didn't want to see it. Uh, they had their preconceived ideas. They, they were suffering fr from self-importance. They thought it's, it's a great honor to sit in the Kremlin, in the palace of, of Congresses, next to, a, next to a debil from Kremlin, and, uh, you know, talk about peace as if uh, that person from Politburo means anything in, in peace movement. Self-delusion is, is the most predominant phenomenon among these people. Ramesh Chandra is, is a very shrewd politician who takes advantage of naive, misguided, idealistically minded, sometimes sincere people. Uh, but he is, I, I, I would, my impression is that he's totally sold himself to the Soviets. He receives his payments or royalties or whatever you can call it in the form of prizes. Of course, it's very embarrassing if you if you if you approach a person of his caliber with money with cash, and say, "Here, Comrade Ramesh Chandra, there is money for your propaganda uh, in the interests of the Soviet Union." It's very impolite. So instead, the Soviet Union creates artificial international bodies such as Jawaharlal Nehru Peace Committee which consists of various progressive leaders, writers, uh, sometimes they're, they're known figures, and uh, philosophers, educationalists. Uh, sometimes they probably feel that if there's no other possibility to express the de desire for peace, at least there is some legitimate overt activity where they can express themselves, that's okay. And they think they are too smart not to see that uh, part of it is Soviet propaganda. Okay, we are smart. We are not going to allow them to use us for propaganda purposes. This is wishful thinking, because after five or six visits, visits to USSR, everything is paid by the Soviet uh, government. After spending several vacations on the Black Sea coast, in luxurious atmosphere with two or three nice girls, interpreters, Lots of vodka and caviar, books published, rapid books which nobody reads in the United States, all of a sudden published in millions of copies in the USSR in various languages. 
that tickles their ego. They think they are some somebodies all of a sudden. It's difficult to resist the temptation. Ramesh Chandra is exactly that type of personality. He was approached at, at, at a very early stage, uh, and uh, he didn't have willpower and moral principles to resist the temptation, to resist the approach. And by now he's, he's just a pawn in the game, high-ranking pawn. And um, uh, if he is dis dismissed or dies natural death, there will be another the, the line of people who would like to take his place. Yes, KGB takes very active part in the, in the peace movement. Uh, and if these people were sincere as they say they are, they would start demonstrating in Kremlin, or I mean in Red Square, not in Washington DC or in, in, in the Central Park in New York or in Los Angeles. But they don't have courage, they don't have guts to go to Russia and protest against the nuclear armament of the Soviet Union. Therefore, I agree that they are misguided, but I think they are cowards. They are unprincipled, dishonest people. And there's no justification that they are misguided or poorly informed. It's their fault that they're poorly informed. There's enough information, there's enough possibility. In case of United States citizens, there's enough freedom to do what their consciousness should tell them to do. Go to Russia and protest against armament. It doesn't take much courage to, 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 to take part in demonstration in Los Angeles. But if you're really genuinely concerned about peace, tell it to Brezhnev, tell it to Andropov. And we'll see how courage, courageous and sincere you are. They don't do it. Well, the greatest strength, I think, is, is uh, uh, the, the basic principle of American democracy, common sense, and the, uh, the value of, of, of the principles of private property and, and, and respect to human dignity and, and indivi individual rights. The weakness is the permissiveness and lack of moral stamina, which if you are a religious person could be could be interpreted as probably alienation from religion alienation from god thinking too much in materialistic terms thinking in short span of time for pragmatic advantages disregarding the perspective of civilization some philosopher, I forget his name, I'm, I was a bad student in Moscow, said that the level of civilization is in direct proportion to the time span that human being thinks in, in future, for future. The least civilized people live today, this minute. The more civilized nations think about tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. Well, this is one of the definitions of... Unfortunately, Americans are made to think in shorter and shorter time span terms. This is the greatest weakness. So therefore, enjoy life and make love, not war. I, I think that willpower and revitalization of traditional moral values and principles is the most desirable thing now, today, the, the sooner the better. The things, the, the principles and values on which the affluence and success of American civilization depends and, and based upon should be immediately civil, uh, uh, revitalized and brought back to school programs, to media, and let's face it, propaganda, I'm not afraid of this word, unlike the left liberal journalists who think, oh, well, it's propaganda. I don't see anything wrong in propagating the basic moral principles and values on which America is built. Willpower, faith, unshakable faith that this country, this civilization is right and the enemy is wrong. No amount or no number of nuclear warheads and, and no size of the army will, will help United States to survive, whether there is nuclear war or conventional warfare. Vietnam proved very clearly 
that with all the technology, with all the supersonic bombers and napalm and whatnot, electronic gadgets and, and cold beer and Coca-Cola, you cannot defeat an enemy unless you are fighting and have faith in the righteousness of your fight. So that's the most urgent thing, I think. Wake up and, and, and convince yourself that you are on the right side. There should not be no neutralism or object, objectivity. Or Objectivity is good when you are discussing philosophical concepts. In today's world, if you are neutral, you are already an enemy.